Okay, so good morning, everybody. I hope you enjoyed your uh, sailing trip yesterday. Also, maybe you got some new skills in rowing or sailing. I don't know. Um, so a couple of uh, so a couple of announcements. So today we're going to have uh, Pierre and Zalal. They're going to talk to us about uh, uh, consumer setting electricity markets and electricity markets with renewables. And we also have your projects. So uh, the ones that you still haven't actually given us a priority or maybe a list of the members that you would like to have in the project, let us know, right? So at 1.30, we're going to start with that. Before exactly, so at 1.30 exactly, actually, we're going to have uh, uh, Michal. Michal is a scientist in Mosec. He's developing uh, the, the, uh, some part of the, of the code of the solver. He's going to talk to us a bit about applications for comex optimization. So, a bit, so what they do with conic optimization and also where, it's not only energy systems, right? I mean, forestry uses a lot of optimization. Of finance uses a lot of optimization. So he's going to talk a bit about what you can do with this, uh, these approaches. Uh, and as it has become usual, uh, maybe we can spend five minutes uh, discussing about yesterday. So yesterday we had MISA. Uh, talking to us about integrated energy systems, and uh, we also had a nice tour and a sailing trip. I would like you to focus more on the, on, on the morning part, <laughs> but if you have any important takeaways from, uh, from the afternoon, I, I would also be very happy to hear about that. Okay. So let's spend the five minutes and, and talk about that. Okay. So let's hear what the... Uh, so let's hear your takeaways. Somebody would like to share something with us from yesterday? So who is doing uh, integrated energy systems here? So, who, yeah, Alvaro, who else? Yeah. So how did you find the lecture? It was interesting. Mm -hmm. A lot of ideas were generated regarding what could be future directions for research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There were still many questions which I wanted to get done with the <laughs> Have you asked, uh, have you seen the slides? Yes. Yeah, okay. So the ones that don't do uh, gas networks or heat networks, what is the major takeaway that you might have heard from yesterday? I have a list of takeaways, guys. And I checked the slides just today morning for, for five minutes. Yeah. systems is different, but in Norway it was to push as much gas through as possible, and in US it was to use as, as little pumping as possible, more or less. Nice. Yes. Very nice. Yeah. And then in power systems, generation should be equal to the demand, and then in gas systems, it, this is not required. Great. And wha what, so what is also associated with that? The line pack. Yeah. Right? Line pack. So this means that we can store gas in the pipes. And this means that if we actually optimize electricity and gas together, right, we can take advantage of the storage that the gas networks offer. And this can be really important. Okay. Yeah. I have more of a question. Yes. I'm not sure if I believe that there are no losses because you said that okay, the gas doesn't go out of the pipeline. But I have seen quite some articles that say that there are huge methane losses from, from gas transport system. So I'm not sure if it's the transmission system or if it's the distribution system. But I do think that they have lost. Do you know that, Pierre? You can use the gas to power the active elements in the network. So that's what some networks do. So like the compressor thing that pushes the gas forward can be powered by the gas in the network itself. So that maybe could be considered a loss. Yeah, I think that's the point. That's mainly what you talk about in terms of losses. It's in terms of energy content between beginning and, and the end. Right? But otherwise, the gas doesn't go. I, I thought that they were saying that you really have methane escaping into the atmosphere, and that's really bad because the global warming potential is 20 times, 25 times higher than CO2. Right? Yeah. But uh, so these are leaks. You, you are talking yeah, about leaks. Two different issues. Yeah. I think when you talk yeah. about losses, is what was said is in terms of energy losses. Ah, yeah. What you talk about is yeah, leaks. Yeah, leaks. Yeah. Yeah. But then it so maybe some of the papers are mixing the terminology. Yeah. But in principle, when you talk about losses, there's no losses in the. So in an ideal pipe, there are no losses. That's the right. Yeah, it should be. It should be. 
Um, anything, uh, so how, how can this, okay, so there are only two that actually do integrate energy networks here. Anybody else that is doing gas or heat? Yeah. So how do you think this can help uh, your research? Do you also do optimization? Yeah. yeah. I think when you were talking about hourly and uh, uh, minutes, uh, resolution is really different. So the, the way he introduced the dynamics is very good. Yeah, very nice. And he also showed this Aquarius theorem, right? Ma the Mark Vufre actually, uh, with Misa, they, they proposed that. How he can actually simplify the whole, uh, these variations with an envelope around it. Maybe you want to check that paper. I think it's going to be quite interesting. Yeah, Alvaro. I have to comment that it's mostly about, like, okay, maybe as engineers, uh, we would just try to optimize everything together and try to say, okay, this ideal work to do it right. But then when we take into account that we're using gas network, it's a bit slower. Then we would have to also take into account that, okay, we cannot do, like, a, let's say, kind of economic dispatch of the network. Not only a technical time horizon, but also like a factual one. Uh, all, not only a technical? Uh, so you have to have yeah. a contract with the gas company and basically tell them for the following day I need this. So how, like how to do it in a timely manner if you have new information and things like that? So it's that that's, that's a nice, you definitely need to, to take both time scales into account. Right? No, but now exactly how uh, this uh, Talking about the market aspects, the, the gas market is moving towards the, the electricity timescales. So if you think of a day head market in, in gas, if you five, ten years ago it was like a no uh, in Europe, no. But today uh, they are becoming very important and the people are moving to these markets. So, so that helps a lot that you have this kind of consistency in terms of time, time scales for the markets. And then also for balancing, if you talk to people in Denmark, traditionally the balancing for gas is done on a daily basis. So there's no incentive to really think on an hourly basis like for electricity, but they're gonna move towards <coughs> that also so as to have some kind of consistency. Uh, and in the US, for instance, the, the, the biggest step they made to help for integrating electricity and gas is just to align the markets. So to make sure you know that one market clear after the other and that you have the exchange of information. And it seems most of the benefit came just from that, not doing crazy optimization and really advanced thinkings in terms of the dynamics, the line pack and so on, just aligning the markets. So I think it's, it's a very good point. Uh, but Misha doesn't like markets, yeah. he didn't tell you about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's more interesting. Yeah, and, and also, final comment, like in Russia it's totally different because what you say now, they basically synchronize the market, but in Russia you have a market on a monthly basis. Yeah. So basically it gives you like a really big uncertainty if you're also trying to optimize it. Yeah, yeah. No, but that creates suboptimality. Uh, uh, yeah, it's like, it's like in China with long-term contracts uh, with certain uh, producers that then uh, introduce some kind of constraints in any kind of their market you may want to have, right? So, so it's a bit of the same as well. Yeah. Uh, in regards to what uh, Ian mentioned, uh, over here, for example, in Europe then, if you're waiting for the gas market to clear or the electricity market to clear, does it mean that if you're trying to solve it as two different <coughs> system operators and you try to do it in this distributed way, always waiting for one or the other or how does like how would you oh, so in Europe they are not coordinated okay. that's that's a very uh, very soft coordination because you have some actors that are kind of on both sides right or have some interest on both sides and and they are doing the coordination so it's it's almost like a, a virtual bidding or, or, or traders that uh, that do their best to, to, to do to have some liquidity and, but it's it's very weak the coordination and it shouldn't be coordinated if you look at uh, regulation and uh, political uh, decisions that we have. So they want to align, so as we were saying, if you align, you get a lot of benefits already, because those people who can do arbitrage or coordinate, then they have the right information at the right time, but you don't want to actively just put them together. Yes. Is it enough for integrated energy systems for What's is that? Yes, yes, I think <laughs> that's enough. Now it's time to, but before we move on, one takeaway from the Viking uh, ship yesterday. <laughs> so, who'd like to, yeah? Something about yesterday? Yeah. It goes too much into the wind, the, 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 the sail starts 
Right. You were holding the rudder in, in when I was having, yeah, I was yeah, the yeah, yeah, <laughs> the rudder. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so let's yeah. uh, uh, yeah. You can uh, Google the, the Viking Ship Museum and uh, what was the name of this storm? There was a storm a few years ago. You can find very impressive pictures offline. This museum and all the boats were really uh, in danger. And uh, so it, it's quite nice that they managed to save them all and you could sell uh, now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a good idea to put this museum just next to the water. But when there's a storm, it, uh, it gets a bit tricky. All right, we're going to discuss something else uh, today. It's, it's going to be a bit uh, more relaxing, hopefully. Uh, it's, it's not really mathematical. There, there's a bit of mathematics, but it's not crazy advanced. For those who really want uh, to do more, uh, there's a project. One of the projects is about this topic, and, and it gets quite uh, technical if you really want to invest yourself in it. Um, and then there's, uh, there's some papers. I will mention a lot of papers uh, written by Fabio, who is not here. I thought he would be here. Uh, Thomas and others. So the names that are here, there's also Tiago, I didn't put, there were other names. So we wrote quite a few papers on this topic, so if you're interested, you can just open the papers and, and check them out. But before we start, if I want uh, to uh, make a strong uh, point today, I need to know how good you are with electricity market. Hi, are you, who is an expert in electricity market? I have one expert. I have two friends, three friends. Edouard, yeah, okay. Yeah, you have, a good you have a good background, good education, you should be okay. Um, who, who knows about electricity market but doesn't feel like an expert? Okay, most, most of you. And then who doesn't care about electricity market? Like, at all? Be brave, be brave. So you don't care about electricity market. That's all right. So challenge, challenge accepted. In one hour and something, I, I need to make sure that now you want to do some stuff with electricity market. All right. Good. So um, the topic is actually very uh, trendy right now, uh, maybe for wrong reason. Uh, you've seen there's a lot of focus on blockchain, a lot of focus on uh, microgrid uh, related stuff. Uh, and uh, when, when you, you see what people promise with blockchain or, or microgrid in a liberal environment, it always goes towards this uh, super cool concept actually of peer-to-peer -peer electricity market. What I want you to, to get out of this lecture today is that there's something more general there. There's something that is actually more powerful than just the idea of uh, exchanging electricity peer to peer. There's this idea of flipping the game and making electricity market consumer centric. Uh, and I explain you what I mean uh, by that and uh, how it's gonna go. All right. But before we go there, to be sure that we are on the, the same ground, I'll give you a little uh, recap about electricity market. And uh, we didn't win the game against Denmark but France did something nice a little uh, time ago. It's, it's an hyperlink, so you can click uh, when you have the slide. Uh, it's a post in French on LinkedIn. I hope it's still there. I think it's one year and something old. Uh, we've been doing some research in Denmark on the topic. We've been pushing for it, asking the, the research council to found research on this type of topic. And they say, we don't believe in it. No one cares, etc., etc. And then there was this thing, um, Jalal found online something. I found online something. And then something popped that France was regulating towards consumer-centric electricity market. So this uh, law in France is called the collective uh, self-consumption. Uh, so it means that as a group of people, you can be seen as one by the system and you can decide on how you self-consume, right? Maybe when I say it like that, or if you read the law, if you can read French, it doesn't sound so advanced and so fancy. But if you think of it, it gives a lot of freedom in terms of what you can do. So it's like, you know, we always have this concept of behind the meter, but behind the meter normally is just for yourself. You have your house, and what happened behind the meter in your house, you do whatever you want. But here it's like pushing the meter further away, saying, okay, behind the meter can be for a group of houses, all right? And the law doesn't go very far. It's only like you can be 12 uh, households. But it's the first step. You know, you don't want to create some anarchy right away. You want to make sure that it could work okay. So we've seen it as an experimentation. After one year, uh, they made the study to see how it was going. It's not going so well, actually. Uh, not because the law is stupid, not because the technology is not there. It's just that it's very difficult to jump, you know, and, and to go towards this concept. We, we see it's going to come. So there are some other countries that are, are going to follow. 
Uh, but yeah, you may want to, to look at uh, the French case. Uh, there are some other cases, but I think the French case is, uh, is interesting there. All right. Okay, so I was telling you, I will need to give you a brief recap on electricity markets. Because, again, to make a, a, a point here, you need to understand how it works today and why it's really uh, disruptive and fundamentally different uh, where we're going to go. After that, I will uh, uh, give you a, a broad audience uh, overview of what we're talking about. And, uh, and I'll discuss two proposals for how to organize uh, this consumer-centric electricity market to finally go to something that we hope will come. Uh, it's going to be difficult, but this idea of consumer-centric electricity market will allow to redesign uh, network charges. Uh, today, network charges are just uh, homogeneous. You know, whatever you do, you just pay the same price. But in a consumer-centric environment, I will explain to you, it will make sense to rethink that. So we're going to try to make it in, what, one hour and ten minutes? It should be, uh, it should be all right. Uh, you can stop me anytime. I really like to discuss during the lecture, so any question... Uh, Anything you want to say? Any comments? You know, you just uh, take this one. It fell the last time I put it here, right? Okay, so I'll send it from here. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, I have to make it darker. Okay. You have the mic. Yeah, you you started, so you have the mic. How can I make it darker? Do you know? It's not me. Uh, I don't control here. Add the room to be darker. This I can do. Uh, down. I thought you were talking about the screen. Then the screen is a bit difficult for me. So good night. If I see one of you sleeping, it's not going to go okay. Okay. So a brief recap on electricity market. As I said to yeah. So now it should be alright. Huh? To to make my point. Okay. So. For those who know how electricity market work, could you give us a, a quick two-sentence uh, two description of how electricity market work today? Who is brave enough to tell us in two sentences? Yes, please. Do I need a cube? Or? Yeah, if we can have the cube. So, ca two sentences, huh? Two sentences. In two, two sentences. Words. Towers to the renewable energy to this electricity market. Mostly tow goes to the uh, renewable energy based markets. Yeah. Uh, second one is mostly uh, distributed resources by considering also the consumers themselves. This is not what I was looking for. Oh. <laughs> You're going towards the, the rest of the lecture by saying these kind of things. No, so uh, that's all right. Don't worry. Yeah, y you, you want another try? Um, different actors bid into the markets and you make like a market crossing to find the prices. Merit or Merit or yeah. Okay, so basic economics, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This was more what I, I thought <laughs> you would say. And we, we call it the wholesale electricity market, right? So we have all these actors uh, who come and it's, it's a forward mechanism. So it's really in advance of delivery. Uh, it's quite a lot in advance, if you think of it. In uh, Scandinavia, the market clears at 12 for the following day, midnight to midnight, uh, with periods of delivery of an hour. And in the wholesale market, we have all agents that come. So you have uh, producers uh, with a little I, you have consumers with a little J, right? Uh, and they make a bid. And the bid is classically a block, right? So as a producer, you say, I'm ready to produce this block of energy for a certain price, okay? So an offer for a producer is going to be a block of energy. So I don't know, we're going to call it a YPI, okay? And a price. So that's an offer. And a consumer is going to do the same, but obviously on the consumption side. So it's how much I would like to consume in terms of energy for this time period. And I'm ready to pay this price, all right? So I think it's translating what we just heard here. Yeah? No, I say it's the simplest form. After, hopefully, uh, we would like some more advanced products uh, because the blocks are suboptimum. Uh, so you want to offer a curve, for instance, because you say my cost will depend on the, on the amount, right? Uh, and you can do that very easily. The, the what's called, like, uh, the conventional, the standard uh, way to offer in the North Pole is that you directly go with a curve. You can describe your curve with the 633 points, I think. So you can differentiate. So instead of a block, it's like you have 633 blocks 
with different quantity and different price, and they are uh, getting ordered by themselves. All right. So then we were hearing in terms of uh, basic economic uh, theory, what we want to do is to order these people. The suppliers are ordered with increasing price. Okay. So actually, they are blocks. Huh? I just made it uh, more continuous. But these are all the blocks of the suppliers. And for the consumers, it's, okay. it's the same, the other way around. We uh, rank them in decreasing price order, all right? So also, they are blocks. And then we have this equilibrium point that appears that will give us the schedule and the price, all right? The people who are on the left of this point, they're going to be scheduled, being producers and consumers, right? And this will be the price in the market. So for a given hour, you have a price that comes from this equilibrium, all right? That's very, very, very basic uh, two minutes market theory uh, for you, all right? There's a lot more to it. If you follow a course uh, where they cover economic dispatch, even power flows, you know, you have the basic economic dispatch in there. Uh, you can see that this, this problem, here we make it, we, we show it in a very graphical form, but you can write it as an optimization problem where you want to optimize the social welfare, right? And the social welfare, what did I do with my joke? So the social welfare will be that we want to maximize the sum of the, um, uh, if we want to maximize it, we want to, no, we want to maximize, yeah. We want to max maximize this area here, so it's going to be the sum of, how did I write it? So the consumer's, uh, Payment, what my notation, you can see better than me. No, it's too dark for me, right? Right, minus the payment, right? And there's going to be a constraint that the sum of the production minus the sum of the consumption is equal to zero because supply has to be equal to demand, all right? So that's why I want to stop with the basic electricity market stuff. What you need to remember here from there is that we do social welfare maximization, all right? And that we have one equilibrium point that we want to look for. And this one equilibrium point comes from this balance equation. When you have this balance equation, the dual variable here, when you solve the problem, the value of the dual variable is the price. Okay, and that's what I say. We had a discussion with Misha, who gave you the, the lecture. Uh, we had a discussion at the restaurant, and he's like, oh, I hate this stuff, you know. It's, so, it's such a simplistic view of how to determine a price, but this is basic uh, economic theory. All right, so you have to remember that, because after, yeah, Dirk, you have uh, something to say? Huh? Yeah, yeah. You need a microphone, then. Thank you. Um, so this is for... Um, the electricity producers to the consumers. Yeah. Uh, I see this as one side of the market, but there's also a side of the market where the uh, project developers sell something to the electricity producers. Yeah, yeah. And then I was going to get, I was going to get there. Okay. That's right. So this is normally what we teach: the wholesale market and this day ahead mechanism is the central part of the market. Obviously, there are many things around. Uh, there are markets for system services. There's a market in real time uh, to correct for differences between the schedule and what's really happening. Uh, there are other markets uh, where people make PPAs and so on, so direct agreements. And maybe the most important market for all of us is the retail market, right? The guys who are in this market, they are the big guys. So the producers have big quantities. The consumers here are actually retailers who buy big quantities to after redistribute uh, to us in a way, right? Okay, so, so there's much more to it. But what I need here is this uh, basic theory so that you understand what's gonna come uh, afterwards. Do you know how much you pay for your electricity in general? Do you have an idea? Because that's gonna help if you, if you have no idea. And do you know also the cost structure? So if you pay, I don't know, uh, in euro, it's what, 0 0.3 euro, I guess, per kilowatt hour? No? You're from Norway? Estonia. Estonia. Estonia is also that cheap? Yes, it's like the same North Pole market. And they have like market price plus margin plus transmission cost plus factory. And you say 0 0.13? Yes. That's cheap. Yes, it is like cheap. In Denmark, 0 0.35 or something like that. That's 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. So we'll get to. But so you have an idea about the cost structure. So a part of it, the cost of energy will come from these wholesale markets and will be passed on to the small consumer, the final consumers, through the retailer uh, with some add-ons. So it comes from the transmission distribution, from the taxes, from uh, yeah, any kind of thing you may want to invent uh, on the way. All right. So we got our brief recap on the electricity market. Now we want to discuss another view on the electricity market. All right. So we have two people from Australia, right? They have not come today. One is here, I'm sure. You're also from Australia, right? And Peter is from Australia. So you're three. You're also from Australia. OK. So what's going on in Australia? Does that exist? Is consumer-centric uh, market? Or? No? You've never heard of Power Ledger? And yeah, I mean, that's only a couple of pilot sites. And it's certainly not going on in any real sense in our country yet. Okay, there's lots of statements and money being announced then for it to happen. And I tell the students, if you want to work further with this topic, go to Australia. Maybe I should change my, my story. Um, why, why I mention Australia, there was um, a public statement. Uh, I think is the CEO of the, the what's called the NEM, uh, the, the market operator uh, uh, and slash uh, transmission grid operator. He made a statement that was very strong. He was saying, you know, it's, li it's nice to have a top-down view and a centralized view. But for a system like Australia, you imagine the size of the power system and the density of population, uh, the cost of having to handle the system when there's a problem, so uh, I don't know, a maintenance, and especially you mentioned bushfires, it was like, you know, if eventually people organize themselves to be resilient and have their own little community that can be self-sufficient once in a while, I love it, you know? And you don't hear that much normally from people that operate a, a system like that because the people who operate such a system, they have this view, that's the best in terms of social welfare. You know, we, we have something that's really centralized, very strong, uh, optimized for everybody. But there's a lot of reasons why maybe you want to decentralize, not just the operation, also the electricity market. All right, so why are we going there? There's something uh, we see also in Denmark. Denmark is a small country. Uh, it's not a solar energy country originally, but we're starting to have a lot of solar. We have uh, one giga of solar capacity. Um, you've seen this kind of idea already before, you know. Before we had this uh, top-down uh, view of the, of the system. So generation, transmission, distribution, uh, final consumers. And today it's a bit more messy. Uh, it's all decentralized. Uh, you can produce uh, with uh, micro CHP or mini CHPs. You can have solar power. Uh, you can have cars that do a V2G. Uh, you can have some mini hydro. I don't know. Uh, just, uh, just tell me what you can have. And the electricity market is not really evolving to accept this new reality. Do you agree with this statement or not? Thank you. So it's not true. We are trying. In Denmark, we've been talking about electricity market 2.0. And then soon we're going to have 3.0. Have you heard of that? We want to have demand response in the market. And for instance, one of the things we propose is that we're going to put aggregators, right? So these aggregators are going to be entities that somehow pull these guys together and are, are going to translate what they want or what they do or what they can do to the traditional electricity market as we have today. So one of the reasons why we care about these aggregators is that it could be some minimum change to make to the electricity market so that we account for this new reality, but we don't fundamentally change the game, all right? It sounds good. There might be a business case for these aggregators, but if you think in terms of uh, social welfare redistribution and fairness, most likely this new actor that you're going to put here to aggregate these guys is going to do the job to be this interface there's going to be increased social welfare, and then when you redistribute, the guy in the middle is going to cash most of the increase in social welfare. So what's in it for the small consumer? Not much. All right? So one of the, the trends now, and it's not only in Denmark, I think if you go to Belgium, you have people that say that, in Portugal, in Australia, and so on. Why don't we just change completely the game, and instead of looking at the market as a top-down object, why don't, say, why don't we say it's a bottom-up thing, right? So everybody can be a market agent, and we have to design um, a market so that these guys can interact. 
in a way that is uh, as uh, healthy, you could say, as possible, as fair as possible, and so that every, everybody um, gets something out of it. All right. Do you have another example? Someone is from Portugal? Damn. Okay. Uh, I have to, can, Isan, can you call Thiago that he comes here? But, uh, Portugal is a good, uh, Spain, someone is from Spain, right? Okay, so in Spain, if you produce solar power on your roof, you have to give it back to the system, right? How much do you get paid for it? Do you know? The year of connection. It, at the beginning, 2007, it was 44, 44 cents per kilowatt hour. Okay, so that was crazy high. And today? Today, it's probably less than half. Less than half than that. In, in Portugal, they had gone down to zero. So somehow, any uh, surplus? So if, if, if you install a TV in your rooftop, you don't get anything back. Right. Ah, voilà, that's, what, that's where I wanted to go. Because in Portugal, you get nothing back. So if you think in terms of markets, normally, you look, at, look at a very liberal uh, open market. So you're a market agent. You, know? you have something you produce. You're bringing something to the, to the game, right? But the payment is fixed. It's zero. So as a market agent, we, we got used to this idea because all of us, we think of the system this way. And then all oh, small, uh, small consumers, they want to have rooftop PV. It's their problem. So when we take their extra energy, they don't get anything. But if you think of it in terms of an open market, it doesn't make sense. Because you're producing something, someone is going to profit of it, and you don't get paid for it, right? So there are these kind of things that are quite fundamental. We got used to them. And we would like this to be completely resought somehow. Uh, so that everybody feels comfortable in this new, uh, new market system. <clears throat> we wrote a paper that gives a, a general view of this, uh, of this issue and where it's going. Uh, it's available through this hyperlink and it's even available in Chinese. So uh, for those who prefer to read it in Chinese, uh, uh, actually you should tell me if the translation is good because I, I don't know. All right. There's, um, there's been a lot of work on this topic. Um, some of you might have met this guy in Oxford, uh, Thomas Molstein. Uh, we invited him a few months ago. He's also uh, going very strong with this idea of peer-to-peer uh, -peer electricity market. And uh, originally, uh, this paper uh, was, I think, one of the best to explain why it's happening, how it's happening, and what are the prospects. It's been written by uh, Yael Parag and uh, Benjamin Sovakul. Uh, Yael uh, is in uh, Israel and Benjamin is, uh, is in the UK. And more than just talking about market organization, they also tell us about uh, some of the business cases, some of the stories uh, that already exist today and business that are profitable. If you, if you think of having a very decentralized and liberalized view of, of the market for the future, actually you can go crazy. Any kind of business case uh, um, you think of, business model you want to develop, uh, you, you can do it pretty much, all right? So, uh, I forgot if, if she's explaining that, but they were, uh, there was a business model, for instance, that was very interesting, that was developed in uh, Boston, is the substitution business model. Did you hear of it? When I say substitution business model, what do you think of? Throw, throw the ball, where's the ball? The microphone, the microphone disappeared. Oh, you keep it for yourself, okay, that's very good. That's very good. So what's the substitution, throw it. You, you got it too long. No, so no one uh, knows what substitution business model may mean? I have an idea. Ah, you have an idea? So th that's why you kept the microphone? So what is that? Maybe it's if you displace the marginal generator? No, 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 no? not at all. That's it's much more pragmatic and down to earth. You have no idea? Okay, so I give you an idea. Uh, you live in the city center of, I don't know where you're from, uh, let's say you live in the city center of Boston, we were in Boston, right? And you would love to contribute to the energy transition by having some solar panel on the, the roof of your house. Bad luck, you live in Boston, you have a small apartment, and you have no uh, ownership of the roof, okay? So the substitution business model was that this company was organizing that you could just somehow pay and buy for solar panels to be installed somewhere else outside of Boston, but any piece of um, unit of energy that's being produced is considered as your own, all right? So that's a substitution business model. Uh, there's been some other business models that still are, are, are valid in Holland that are more what happens for, uh, for food. You know, you have this kind of uh, short, what's called a short uh, circuit thing for food. You can buy food directly from producers. It's being delivered in front of your door once a week or something like that. 
So there were some people who were saying, okay, well, why can't we just uh, also ask uh, this, um, uh, these people, you know, who, who have uh, where, uh, greenhouses, for instance, in Holland, to put a lot of solar panels, and the same way uh, they sell me fruits, they also sell me solar energy, right, directly. So we go towards this peer-to-peer -to -peer idea. And you can have a lot of crazy uh, business models like that. All right? Um, maybe our friend in Ersted are going to come up with uh, some nice business models soon. I I'll discuss it at the end. In terms of organization, uh, the organization that can be seen as very interesting are this one with microgrids. If you think of it, whatever I'm saying today, uh, you could think, OK, people doing research on microgrids, they've already done it. It's just that they are not market people, so they didn't know how to frame it properly, look at the economic properties, how the agents interact, and so on. But distributed control, uh, all the optimal operation on microgrids, you could think of it as going towards this, uh, this peer to peer market. So, disconnected microgrids is a way you could look at it in the future. Interconnected microgrids is also a way. Um, think of it as a small islands uh, that are just being connected. But maybe the models that we would like to look at the most are this one. So it's a full peer-to-peer. -peer. Anyone can interact with anyone. Uh, you just want uh, to source your energy yourself or sell your energy yourself. And this idea, uh, these little circles are, are virtual communities. Uh, and virtual communities, it means that you may want to gather um, and exchange energy with each other, buy your energy together, but you're not on the same location uh, on the grid. Okay? And this makes sense. You know, in Denmark, there are people buying summer houses together. They are friends. They just buy a summer house together, right? Uh, there are lots of things we do today where we share some kind of infrastructure. So why couldn't we share also uh, our energy and our sourcing of energy? Okay. So we would like to do it for real. Every second week, uh, you see something online. If you're a bit geeky and you look at the tech news, uh, there are some announcements. So two days ago, it was in Finland. There are some people who announced they're going to have this uh, village when they're going to do peer-to-peer -peer trading. There's one in Sweden called Simris, uh, I think. There's going to be one in Norway soon, I'm sure. Uh, and obviously, in Denmark, uh, we have to do the same. Uh, we have a project here. It's called Svalin. It's a community housing. Uh, it's very typical in Denmark that people want to live together. It has existed for a very long time. And so it's 20 families here, for instance. They have their own house, but they've made some kind of a social contract that they want to live together. They design the houses and the system, the energy system together, etc. Uh, and so they want to go to the next level. They want to share also their energy. The community is energy positive. They produce more solar power than they consume energy per year. All right. Uh, they have uh, electric cars and so on, so they are quite uh, forward-looking. There's a YouTube video, if you want, you Google uh, Svalin, uh, Svalin uh, Energy, and you can, uh, you can find a... Uh, it's in Danish, but with subtitles, so... All right. The thing is that it's only 20 families, so, uh, okay, uh, a community with 20 people is pretty much like uh, what I said with the French case. Is they're under the same feeder. It's quite easy, you know, to organize some kind of exchange. It sounds really fake, you know. It's uh, just uh, some accounting. We just say, you exchange with me, we do this, we do that, right? But at the end of the day, there's already quite a lot of nice business models we can look at. Yes? Uh, for Be careful, it's coming. <laughs> Uh, for these projects which are being uh, in which will be investigated yeah. will is there any uh, information about the data which is going to be collected and is it going to be open source or is it going to be any Have you heard information of GDPR? On the <laughs> <laughs> so uh, i mean uh, i will not take the risk to publish any of the data i would love uh, i would love to um, you'll see later when when I discuss investigation, we always show results based on this Australian data that uh, Peter knows. I mean, um, it's it's very difficult uh, right now in Europe. You know, maybe we're too scared. I don't know, but still, I think it would be very clumsy to try to publish this data. Uh, originally, we made a contract for this project where we asked the people, and they say obviously we don't mind, and so we thought it was okay. But the the lawyers around, or even if you talk with specialists. It, even if people say it's okay, it's still not okay. GDPR is extremely strict in terms of what uh, you can and cannot do. So, uh, so yeah, it's too difficult. Yeah. Just a How about you normalize the data and sort of remove the, you know, the things you can understand out of it? Yeah. But for research purposes, I guess it could work. I don't know. I mean, uh, we, we we can investigate it further, but as of now, I don't know. I think there's a lot of 
nice places around the world where people are investing a lot to create these data sets. And you need a lot of energy and will to do that. Uh, so here, I don't know if we're going to do it, but you can find some very nice data set from London, from Texas, from Australia. So uh, waiting for this one, <laughs> you can do a lot of good things. All right, but so this is very small. What I would like to do is to scale it up to a full neighborhood of Copenhagen, uh, this no-harm neighborhood with 40,000 inhabitants and uh, 40,000 office spaces. Uh, the nice thing with Nohan is that you have this international school that's covered with solar power and can be a big source of energy locally and everybody just buy energy directly from it. Uh, there's a battery that could serve as a buffer also uh, in the car park. Uh, and then we could try a few business models. So one of the business models I wanted to try is that when you go to the car park with your Tesla, uh, you say, I only want to charge my Tesla with solar power locally, right? And then you may actually chip in to reserve some capacity in the battery so that you make sure that you know, the power gets stored somehow in the battery on the way and then you get power from this, uh, from this school. All right, another place where we'd like to do it is Bornholm, where there's been, I mentioned that the first day in the introduction, there's been a lot of experiments on demand response. So there's a lot of houses equipped, you know, uh, there's a lot of very good education out there. People have been invested in this kind of stuff for already five to eight years. So it could be very nice uh, to, to try it there uh, eventually. Yes, Eduardo, can you throw the microphone? Thank you. The, to the demand response, you say people are educated. Because I think there was a study uh, some years ago in my institute where they found that people in the uh, beginning were very interested and did uh, st stuff like uh, start there, try uh, later and stuff. Yeah. But after two, three years, they just got bored and went back to their normal behavior. Yeah. Did you also experience so that? I have, or? Two, I have two, uh, two answers to that. One is that there's a lot of tech involved. You okay. know, it's uh, mainly um, uh, what's called automatized uh, demand response. And uh, even when it's automatized, you know, the first thing that people want is to opt out at any time, you know, otherwise I don't accept your tech. Uh, then there's a lot of different aspects. There, there's two papers on the project in uh, what's called energy research and social science where they've made interviews with the people and they tell what they've been uh, uh, saying, etc. But the other thing, um, the lead, our boss uh, here, has been uh, telling around, and that was one of the roots for our work also, why on Bonholm it works nicely is that there's a community feeling. And one of the reasons why we want to fit the game with this electricity market is that today when it's top down, you don't feel involved. It's not your game, you just get your electricity. But if you do it bottom up and you organize yourself, if you share energy, I don't know, with your friends, you buy solar panels with the yeah, family members and so on, maybe you feel much more involved, you know, it's a common project. And community feeling helps a lot. There are papers in Germany, in Israel, etc., where they explain that community feeling with energy actually make a difference. So, so this is uh, also one of the reasons why we want to do that. Svalin, uh, if you look at the small video, these people are extremely committed. Uh, and they are really into this community project. Okay, we need to move on and do a bit of math now that we had this uh, high level discussion. How are we going to do it? Do you have some idea of how you would do that? Do we just uh, leave it as a, an anarchy, you know, you just make agreements with whoever you want? And you just hope uh, there's going to be some cables enough on the way to get your electricity? Or how are we going to do it? Yeah, but you need to design your market. So you know, that's, that's the beauty of markets is that you, you design a game somehow where you know how it's going to happen and you're going to ensure that certain properties are met. So we need to design the game for, for it works, right? Yes, Dirk, uh, microphone. Thank you. I think... One aspect should be that the investment cost that you put if you yeah, build your own infrastructure is um, oper operationalized fairly. Yeah. And um, then one should probably also account on how much each individual has used and possibly when they have used it. Yeah. And compare it to the value of the uh, external electricity. Okay. So that's actually a good point. And I skipped that today in my lecture, so well done. <laughs> we, had a, we had a course on business models for this kind of community and peer-to-peer -peer market, and most of the students worked on that. It's actually a very nice model. If you think of it, you buy solar panels together. If you go to France, for instance, most of the projects are like that today uh, in that frame. So we are five to buy solar panels together. Let's say we chip in with the same amount of money. Then we say we systematically have access to 20% of the production, all right? 
But then maybe there are some days you don't need your energy and someone else needs more energy. So then you, did, you design a mechanism to kind of transfer uh, ownership of this uh, energy that is produced, all right? So this kind of design are very simple and they can be very powerful, all right? But there, there are some issues uh, with it also, so that's why we went uh, into a more advanced uh, form that are more focused on uh, having an optimization uh, machinery behind. And so Fabio, you've met Fabio around, uh, I guess he's part of the organization for the summer school. He's doing this PhD of that, on that. And uh, we've been designing what we call energy collectives. So it, it's a group, you can see it as a group of people that I need together. Uh, and we're gonna decentralize the electricity market so as to focus on this small community, all right? The reason why we designed that is because we have this community, community I mentioned so you have these 20 families and you want them to be connected to the rest of the world, but you want also that they organize themselves the way they want, all right? Okay, so the energy collective is this, uh, these few people in it together. Uh, here the four, uh, the four people are my co-authors on this work. Uh, Lucien and Etienne are master students who wrote papers with me, Thomas also and Fabio also. Uh, if we were um, normally acting on the market, we just buy our energy uh, directly from the market and if we have a surplus solar, if we have solar on our roof, we would uh, give it back to the system. In Denmark you get a bit of money, but uh, the differential is uh, it hurts also. Huh? Alright, if we were to, work, to be in it together, the first thing we would do, so we could buy solar panels together, that's another story, but the first thing we could do is to say, yeah, two seconds, the first thing we could do is to say, okay, now we know we need together, so why don't we try to match our consumption and production so as to minimize collectively this differential of money that we lose because energy is bought by, by the system, all right? So you start somehow having some kind of transfer of energy within the community because you have this idea of collective matching, all right? Payment? Okay, that's far for the microphone. Whoa! Oh. It's going to survive the week, the microphone, <laughs> hopefully. Yes? Yeah, just one uh, question. Uh, we as engineers and researchers, we go, through, uh, we go to, towards this uh, problem, let's say, where you're designing a lot of models, by solving a lot of things, creating new problems maybe. Did you ever consider sitting down with lawyers, come up with some, let's say, model that they, are, they say they are okay? Yeah. and then attack, let's say, that problem from that perspective? But so th that's exactly what I, I, I said before. Uh, the, the French law allows to have the flexibility and freedom to design these kind of things. While in Denmark it's totally illegal, for instance, to, uh, unless you're really behind the meter as a community, uh, by definition, but normally as a single house, you cannot associate yourself with others. So it's impossible to just get lawyers. Lawyers will come and say, but it's illegal, so don't even try, right? So I, I agree with you, that's a, that's a big issue. Before you start designing something, you have to make sure that the regulation and legal framework are law for it. True. All right, so there was something very interesting, and we come to, to your question of earlier. One of the motivation to, to rethink our relationship to energy may also be that it's not just about the energy, not just about the money, but there's a social component to it. This community with whom we work, they are focused on social capital, end of the parenthesis. So the first uh, thing they told me is like, you know, Pierre, for us, we've paid already for solar panels, uh, so solar power is free. So it's going to start being ridiculous that if we exchange energy, we, we bill each other, you know, what are we going to bill each other? One euro cent uh, per day or what? It's, it's going to be ridiculous. But if we do it together, maybe we can define uh, something, some kind of local currency uh, that's going to make we owe each other something. And already because they live in this community housing, they, they have that. They cook together, they have some kind of local currency about how they invest time in the community, uh, you know. So they say, oh, we're just going to add energy to it. And the first thing they propose is to say, can we not define, you know, one hour of babysitting of the neighbor's kids is equal to this amount of kilowatt hours from your solar panel. So that makes people laugh, but they're super serious about it. And the last time we talked, it was about hours of gardening for the community. Okay. To be more serious, if you go to the, um, the EU uh, Association of Energy Communities, it's called RISCOOP. RISCOOP has a lot of energy communities in Europe. I forgot how many there are, but 1,500 maybe, even more than that. Huh? 
uh, they are involved in an EU project where they say, well, actually, this is a way to look at demand response with an aggregator, as everybody is talking about, but here the aggregator is non-profit. It's just this community that gathers. They want to do something for the system or they interact with the system, and there's no agent that's trying to make money. So you could have an aggregator here, and uh, Fabio called that a community manager, but he doesn't want to make money. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Uh, what is not possible to make that uh, exchange in terms of energy? Because, uh, I mean, you, you uh, count the amount of energy that you give to the system, yeah. and that's what you have. I think that's what we do in Brazil. So you have your like, CPR number, yeah. and if you have your summer house, and then you create energy, you can use that energy in your house. That's different, Are but in terms of energy, not money. Yeah. That you, you cannot do that here. But what, but why is it, like, why is it not possible to, to make the market in terms of energy? Like, no, not in money. I'm not sure of what the, you mean. Uh, buy, you know, for import of a sport of energy. Yeah. Maybe you'll explain me during the break because I'm not sure of what you mean. Okay, um, okay but wh what I wanted to say is that these communities can also provide uh, services to the grid the same way people are sort of demand response. We had a master student defending the other day on that. I told you there's a full EU project. If you ask too many questions, we won't finish today. <laughs> yes? Yeah. The technology required? Uh, yeah, I say fundamentally the difference is okay. for profit or not for profit, right? After who invests, uh, who uh, takes care of the system and so on, we, we could have many scenarios, but fundamentally the difference is being for profit or not for profit. So if here the community manager or the way they gather together is not for profit, that means that any increase in social welfare, it will be redistributed to the people readily, right? Okay. Uh, so this is the way you could see it as uh, organized. Think of this as a prosumer. In the notation later, I will split between producers and consumers because, I mean, to see everybody as prosumers is obviously what we should do in the future, but to make it simpler with notation and the mathematics, everybody should be either producer or consumer, which is true at any time, you're either producer or consumer anyway. And then, so this would be an energy community and they're all under the system operator slash wholesale market, if you want, or, or the general system. Okay, so that's where I needed to have this mass on the board. Um, here I write it as a minimization problem, while here it was a maximization problem, so you just have to flip a few things, right? Um, but in our simplified setup, uh, let's consider we have a lot of uh, prosumers, and we're going to split them. There are those who consume and those who produce, and maybe they take turn, I don't know. But for a single time, you have to be on one side. And then if you want to maximize social welfare, you want to minimize... Uh, this cost of production minus um, uh, yeah, cost payment for consumption. All right. So this would be the normal welfare, social welfare maximization problem we want to solve. But now in terms of mathematics, we're going to add an extra term. And this function G is about the social contract. And it's about how you're going to value or price your interaction with the outside world. Okay? Maybe it sounds funny, but you're going to see that it's very, very natural. We have the same constraints as before, you know, uh, consumption has to be equal to production, except that you have an extra term for the exchange with the outside world. So it's either import or export, right? And then you have the normal, oh yeah, I'd, I'd forgotten to put the bounds for the, the range of production or consumption of, of the value sector. Okay, so you see I've, I've just added this extra term, and in the literature in optimization, some call it a, a general exchange problem because you have this equilibrium constraints and everybody has their own cost function that's like augmented uh, with a collective term. These are all individual, right? So it can be everyone on their own, but this is collective. It's really the cost is a function of what all of us have done together, okay? And that's why it's a community now. Okay. Oh, yeah, you can generalize that also with the storage if you want. Huh? It's just, I, I want to write it in the easiest, easiest way here. These are cost functions that you could uh, have for your players. So cost function or marginal cost functions. And here I can refer you to any piece of literature where you try to model prosumers in markets and so on. It's very natural to think of quadratic cost function for all players because then in terms of marginal cost functions, which is what you use in your optimization, everything is linear, right? So it's beautiful. 
you want to slide, uh, slide on this uh, on these linear curves, you will see in terms of negotiation and optimization, it's, it's much easier. All right, so you have bounds here. Do you see why I have bounds here for my cost function or for the, the consumer, the supplier, the storage? Do you see? Let me make a little plot. If you think of a consumption pattern for the next 24 hours, right? So this would be your baseline consumption. If you just make your decision by yourself, you're not thinking much, this is how you consume, okay? Now, if you think that you're flexible in terms of consumption, how flexible do you think you're going to be? From everything to everything? Minus infinite to plus infinite? From where to where are you flexible? No, no, from where to where? I was thinking like in terms of magnitude. Yo. Okay, yeah, but it's, it's safe to say that whatever happens, you, you are going to have a, a strict minimum and a strict maximum. So a strict maximum is obvious. Switch on everything in your house, you cannot do more than that, okay? So we have a strict maximum. Then there is a strict minimum. This can be for technical reason and it can be also for human reason. I mean, you're not going to want to switch off everything in your house also. And there's always going to be a little base consumption. So we naturally have these hard bounds. And if you take a slice here and you want to, to make a cost function, right, that means that you're going to have these bounds here. And then maybe in between you have a little elasticity, you know. So you're ready to change your consumption level as a function of, of price or cost, right? So that's pretty much what it shows. And it's the same with a generator. A generator has a maximum and a minimum. You would love the minimum to be zero, but most of them don't start at zero. You know, the minimum uh, output is like 30, 40 percent, say, uh, and then they go to 100 percent. So this is normal to have this kind of bounded uh, utility or cost function for all players. Okay, now we focus on this uh, function g. The function g is a, is a nice thing originally. Uh, it can get a bit nasty in terms of mathematics if you want to, to use it in your in your distributed optimization after. But if you think of it, if you're in a simple market-driven case, you say the way I interact with the outside world is that if I buy electricity, uh, I pay for the market price, and then we distribute in the community. If I sell electricity, I get the market price or whatever the regulator is giving me, right? If you write it like that, you're actually just decentralizing the electricity market as we have it today. and in. I mean, under very uh, simple conditions and so on, you will show that you do the same as having a centralized market, just that in the way you're going to solve it, you distribute. So everybody is doing his little bit. Okay, but where it gets interesting is that we can change this G function and say it's not about the money, but many communities, they say what I want is to be as autonomous as possible, right? We've seen that in Germany, we've seen that in Israel, and so on. So instead, the social contract is that we're going to work together to minimize either any exchange with the outside world, or it can be just the import, for instance. You want to be a net exporter. There can be many ways. But if you write your G function as a norm uh, one or two on the exchange with the outside world, uh, you're going to try to make your community as autonomous as possible. Okay? You can also... I uh, have a min-max uh, view of the problem, and you start pointing fingers. So it's not the aim of this uh, system. I can explain you the mathematical properties after. But you can start pointing finger at the max importer, for instance, in the community. So let's say your community is trying to behave very well, you know, to match each other in the, within the community, and then there's one guy who doesn't pay attention, right? So we have to import all the time because of this guy. If you put all the cost on this person only, instead of sharing the cost, at some point this person will react, right? And if this person gets below the bar and then there's another one with the worst in the community, then it's his turn or her turn to pay for this cost, right? Then it's going to try to behave better and so on. So this kind of uh, L-infinite uh, norm view of the penalization makes that it has a ripple effect. It's an extremely strong tool to try to get everybody to, to do better, right? Okay? Good. If you think of it, now that we have a function that translates a collective cost, we have to understand how this cost is redistributed in the community, and that's where there's a lot of literature in network theory, game theory, control, etc., about fairness. So fairness will be about 
how we redistribute these costs because we say we need together, we share this cost, but we didn't say how. So maybe as we share, there's still a person that paid 90% of all the cost and the others are just sharing the last 10%, right? So is this very fair? So we'll look into that. Okay, in the project, I will uh, ask you, for those who take the project, to eventually solve it uh, with distributed optimization. Stephen Boyd was here at DTU giving a lecture uh, on Monday, I think it was, Tuesday, Monday, Monday, Tuesday, about this ADMM, alternating direction method of multipliers. Uh, it's a very uh, used method today, a very, uh, I think it has become a part of the toolbox of uh, all researchers we know, almost. Uh, ADMM is, is very natural for this kind of setup because ADMM has this idea, I'm going to do distributed optimization, but I have some kind of supervisory node. So when you distribute the optimization, each of the players have their own little update, they solve their own little problem, then they send the solution of their problem in terms of primal variables, so their set point if you want, to this community manager. The community manager has its own problem that can be as simple as a, a fusion of all the information. And then this community manager sends a price back, right? And the price back, the dual variable, will serve as a tool for coordinating uh, each and uh, all individual agents. What happens when you do that, and you can, if you solve it in a distributed manner, a centralized manner, uh, the solutions are supposed to be equivalent because we have nice uh, convex problems here, right? If you do that and you start looking at what's happening, you see that these people are actually implicitly exchanging energy. As I was saying, eventually if you're in a community, what happens is you kind of agree to do some optimal matching for this common objective, right? So if you rewrite the exchanges and you formulate it differently, you see actually these guys are doing peer-to-peer. -peer. It's just that it's coordinated by this community manager, but they are doing peer-to-peer, -peer, okay? Eventually, what happened is that Fabio and some other people, they realized you can reformulate that in a way, so with consensus ADMM, it's one of the, of the way, uh, so that uh, doing it this way or doing it full peer-to-peer -peer would, uh, would be the same. It's just different ways to look at the same problem. Okay, this time is flying. Uh, I will not show you the, some example results. Uh, you can look at the, at the papers. I was saying there's a data, in Australia, a data set in Australia that's really good for doing this kind of stuff. Uh, and you can ask Peter, I think Peter can uh, give you access to the data, tell you everything about the data. That's how I got the data originally, I think. Um, so the data in Australia is very good for doing this kind of studies. All right. Uh, in, this, in this work, we've been looking at a lot of ways to, to manage the community in the way to define this G function and try to understand what are the impacts in terms of fairness. Uh, and you will look at the paper to see how fairness can be uh, defined in different ways. All right. If you think of this organization, I was only looking, let's say, at 20 people in the community in Roskilde. Uh, how is this going to scale? I mean, already Denmark is, what, five, six million people? So how am I going to do that for six million people? And some of you come from countries with much more, I guess. So how are we going to scale these approaches? One of the things we thought of is to have this kind of Russian doll principle. You know, you just nest these communities one into each other. And then if you look at uh, control literature, what you're doing is uh, hierarchical control, you know. Um, so we could do that. Uh, if you think of the link uh, with society, uh, we have a nested structure in society. If you look at the urban design of Copenhagen, we have a nested urban design. Uh, who lives in Copenhagen? Some of you, right? So they can tell you. <laughs> uh, in Copenhagen, each and every block, it's, it's a lot of buildings together where they share a courtyard, right? So this can be a community, right? And then you have a neighborhood, and then you have the city, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, but nested distributed optimization is a bit more involved. So uh, maybe, maybe it's not the best way to go. To be, uh, yeah, to be research a bit more. All right, now comes the fun part. It's nice to do it as a community, but what would be very nice is to go full peer-to-peer. So that's the real, uh, real anarchy. Do you think it's going to become anarchy if everybody can do a uh, peer-to-peer with anybody else? No. no opinion? I think there would need to be still some kind of system operator because now you also need to figure out how the system dynamics and life is and all these kinds of things. 
But we're just talking about the market. I'm not saying uh, we're going to kill the system operator. Um, no, but you're right, you're right. Yeah? Uh, from my point of view, it might be a Stuckelberg game at the end, instead of an unjust pure anarchy. That means there will be a big uh, provider or prosumer, and everybody follows uh, his or her own actions. So my dream of energy democracy here is going to be ruined by your idea of re-centralizing and have a player that controls those, right? Yeah, that might be one of the sides of the evolution. You cannot fit it. Exactly. So democracy is just not possible, guys. You got it? <laughs> no, but actually, you might be right. It's, it's just a balance. balance <laughs> That's all right. Yes? Uh, when you say purely peer-to-peer, -peer, do you mean taking that community manager out of the equation entirely? No, so when I talk pure peer-to-peer -peer now is that uh, if we're in Denmark, in Denmark how many households are we? Maybe two million households. Each and every household can sell or buy electricity from anyone else in the country, right? Any power plant, any other family and so on. And you just negotiate with anyone you want, okay? Yes? Negotiating with uh, the, the other five million people in Denmark to yeah. buy my electricity, right? And then I don't have time to work. <laughs> I mean, uh, automation, ICT, people at DTU designing algorithms. Uh, <laughs> come on, we do it for you, right? So if you, if you want to think of it, uh, one of the scenario would be like uh, you start expressing preferences. We're going to discuss it after. Uh, I would like to buy locally within 20 kilometers. I would prefer to buy solar energy. Uh, I don't know, I have my certain habits. You know, I need more energy from 5 in the morning to 7 in the afternoon. Uh, you may express preferences, then you have a trading bot in your house. That's what they do, this unit for demand response. By the way, we have on Bornholm, they have this kind of algorithms. They, they would just be different algorithms. Uh, and then you can even have reputation mechanisms. So, uh, in relationship with system operation, if you start doing peer-to-peer uh, -peer with some other people and they don't deliver or there are issues or the synchronization with your needs is not very good, uh, all of us, maybe not all of us, but normally people put some stars, you know, on Amazon or any kind of, uh, of uh, websites where you buy stuff online. Uh, why don't we give also uh, some kind of points, stars to energy providers? And then this reputation mechanisms will also be accounted for uh, in the negotiation process. Right, so there's a lot of challenges. Eduardo mentioned some very practical challenges, uh, which is true. Uh, there are mathematical challenges too. Yes, Dirk? Yeah, I was just wondering, because um, okay, if my hotel bed is not nice, I give only one star on Airbnb, but if I have a blackout, I really don't like it, so will there still be some kind of security? Um, yeah, but think of it, even the, the normal wholesale electricity market, there's the guy who is the last guy, you know? So you try as much as possible not to use him, but the way, the day you have a, a situation, this last generator comes in, the prices spike, etc. So it's a bit of the same here. It's like a priority list. Those who have lower reputation, they come after the others, but then the day you need them, they, they come off, right? Um, yeah? Do you, a, uh, do you need a community manager? Do you still need some kind of central coordination or could you just have some kind of rules for dealing with your neighbor um, and eventually... But that's how you design this peer-to-peer -peer market. It's very free. We, I'm discussing just two scenarios today here, but there are many other scenarios that you can, uh, you can think of. All right. Last question, because otherwise uh, I promise you we're not going to finish. Yes? Uh, it's just about... Um it's just about investments into the power system again because sometimes you need quite a long lead time to plan them and you would like to have some planning security. So then if we think this through entirely, would it also mean that the investment decisions are taken kind of so, democratically? Yeah, so th there's many aspects to that. One first, uh, Kameshwa Pula in Berkeley is part of this project and is, uh, is very interested in investment in batteries in this kind of environment, uh, trying to show, you know, that people will have actually an incentive to invest in batteries that will be helpful for the system. And then if you think of the more general pictures, there are some uh, industrial contacts that I cannot name. What they really like with this idea is that they could bring this idea also to the investment level with the crowdfunding of capacities, right? And you could have systems, actually new views on investment that will embrace also this peer-to-peer -peer view. And 
create some localized incentives so people would choose the kind of capacity they want in certain areas of Denmark or I don't know of the world, etc. So there are community projects in Australia, for instance, to buy a shared solar, shared batteries. Um, you could think of many things. And in Denmark, it exists for 40 years. You know, people would buy a wind turbine together in the countryside. So, so it's something that exists. We need to move on, right? OK, so I, I was giving a, a talk on this topic in MIT a few months ago. Yes? Yeah. People asking questions, and then you just stop, skip the challenges, and I want yeah, to... Yeah, yeah, so I was saying the mathematical. I think some of the challenges are also very mathematical. Uh, Mariam will give you a lecture tomorrow morning. Uh, I'm not sure how far she will go with uh, distributed optimization, game theory, etc. But a lot of the nice things we, we want to do here, it, it will get very complex, you know. If you want to scale this kind of idea to millions of points or agents that negotiate simultaneously, I mean, we, d we don't really know how to make this algorithm converge, uh, really. So a lot of challenges are mathematical. And after well, regulation, we mentioned and so on. All right. So I was saying, uh, people in MIT just told me, yeah, Pierre, you know, this was discussed already uh, nearly 30 years ago, this kind of things. Uh, there was this paper by Wu and Vareya, and there was a lot more happening behind this paper uh, with the people in Harvard, like Hogan, uh, uh, saying we want to centralize, we want to have a pool, and people on the West Coast, so it's East Coast, West Coast kind of thing in the US, right? MIT versus uh, Stanford Berkeley. And uh, what they lost uh, this time, it seems. Uh, and these guys were already talking about this idea. They call it uh, multilateral trades. That's what we call peer to peer today. Um, and then uh, Hogan on the other side in Harvard said, well, no, I think we should have a pool based system, which is what we have today, right? So whatever we discuss now is something that has already been discussed 30 years ago, right? We're not inventing anything. Though, talking about the mathematical challenges, what Wu and Varia propose there is how we get everybody uh, in the game together, so the markets and the system operator. And they propose a mechanism um, on how the system operator could actually say yes, no to some trades and close the loop and eventually, you know that when these peer-to-peer -peer markets converge, it converges to a feasible solution for power system operation, all right? What they don't do in this paper is to say how all these people are going to negotiate. They say, oh, it's going to happen, right? And when they negotiate, we, as a system operator, we say yes, no, yes, no to this trade. This work has been revisited recently by people in Stanford. There's a very nice uh, Chinese young man, uh, Junjie, who wrote a paper uh, where he re revisited this idea. Pravin Varia is a co-author. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot more. We have a few works here also that are under review. So there's going to be a lot more work in the future on how you can reconcile this peer-to-peer -peer thing with the network. OK, now we go to the mass formulation. We're going to have to accelerate a little bit. Uh, you have a set of prosumers. Uh, now let's be a bit more relaxed, right? So everybody is a prosumer. And you want to exchange energy with anyone else uh, in the system. So see it as a graph, you know. Everybody is a node. And then any edge that you can draw would be an exchange of energy between these two nodes, these two agents, right? So if you have a full graph, everybody can talk with everybody. Everybody can just trade with everybody. If you start uh, removing edges, somehow people don't talk with each other or they don't trade with each other. Let's start with a full graph. So instead of having one quantity of energy that you buy or you sell, you have a set of quantities. It's the quantity of energy you could buy from agent one, the quantity you could buy from agent two, the quantity you could buy from agent three, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a, your decision variable is a vector per agent, all right? So that's why we have a, here now, uh, it's a set of exchanges. And then you associate the cost to the, the sum uh, of the whole set of exchanges. But the cost function are very similar. It's just you have to replace one value uh, uh, by a sum of all, of all the exchanges. If you think of peer-to-peer, -peer, remember I told you, in a wholesale market, we have one equilibrium point and we have one price, OK? And that's very nice. It's super nice. It's uniform pricing for electricity. But in a peer-to-peer -peer market, what we can do is that we can rewrite the way people are exchanging uh, with a set of reciprocity constraints. So think of your graph and these edges. Whenever there's an edge between two agents, they have to agree, right? So what an agent sees as an exchange this way, the other agent has to agree as the exchange toward him, right? What he buys is what the other sold, okay? 
you can look at it as tension on the edges of the graph. And then the negotiation process is to play in terms of tension on all the edges of the graph. Okay? The thing is that if you have all this tension on each and every edge, you can have a price on each and every edge. So that means, and that's the basic idea of this multi-bilateral trading or, or yeah, bilateral contracts in the old times and so on, we can define a price for each and every trade in this system. So instead of having one price for electricity for all, there can be a differentiated price for each and every trade. All right? And that's where we talked about social aspects before. I think the fact that people would feel, you know, the price is linked to what I decided with each and every one, that already brings a bit more commitment, I think, uh, to this energy uh, game. Uh, than if you have a uniform price, you don't know where it comes from, you know, it's been from the wall cell, it's been transmitted to me, plus some tax, plus etc. Yes? Yeah. There have been... Uh uh, studies or how this price would fluctu fluctuate for a single household or for one entity? No. Okay. No, that's a very good question, but I think it's too early to know that. Uh, yeah. but, uh, maybe we'll get back to that uh, later. Okay, so we say the price can be differentiated, and um, we wrote a paper, it's not published yet. Uh, we've been uh, passed by our friend uh, in Oxford, he already got his paper published a month ago. We say, okay, if everyone can trade with everybody, and uh, they are single households, so they, they have maybe different views on pricing and how much they value energy, maybe we can generalize cost function and add extra things in the cost function. It's not just about the money, right? So you can start internalizing some preferences. So what I was saying, localization, energy type, etc. So one can rewrite the cost function so that they have an extra element, which is a criterion, so for the type of energy, for location, etc., and how much you value this criterion. In terms of generalizing the cost function, it's not very difficult, and it can be plugged directly in the negotiation mechanism, but the effect is very nice, you're going to see. All right, here in this case, we use some kind of consensus-based optimization. You can do ADMM. I'm not going to go to the solution technique. Again, it's better to go... Uh, to the paper, but typically in terms of negotiation between the agents, you're going to uh, negotiate as of today in the wholesale market quantity price, right? Except that you do it iteratively, you just tell people what you want, they answer back saying yes or no, plus a little epsilon, then you strike back, you strike back, you strike back, etc. Okay? And then you hope that's, that's going to converge. Okay, if you apply that in practice, the first illustrative example we made uh, was about location. And I think location is something that's very important for some people. They want, uh, you know, local production, local consumption. And for renewable energy, if you think of it, that was one of the original ideas. Now we're building these huge offshore wind farms, etc., big lines. But originally, that was the idea. We're going to produce energy locally, and we're going to use it there. If you have this peer-to-peer -peer market and people start putting preferences for location, we have these uh, little test cases here. So it's like you have nine uh, households, nine prosumers in two villages. Um, they trade, I don't show you the cost function and so on, you can find that in a paper. They trade with each other, uh, and if they don't think of uh, preferences, they will trade all over the place, all right? So you see each and every line here, it's when there's a trade. And then in terms of exchange of energy or power, you could say between the two sides, this number is not realistic if you think of household, but still that gives you an idea. And that was for a preference in terms of location at zero. If you tweak up this kind of preference, if you see the outcome of the negotiation, there's already much less trades from one side to the other. And uh, here you see it's divided by two, uh, the exchange of energy between the two villages. And if you tweak it up again, you see that people only trade uh, locally. All right? So this is actually powerful. You can have these preference parameters that will uh, imply some kind of structure in exchange uh, among participants. If you want to play with that, this is also an hyperlink. We made a little app in R Shiny uh, with three setups uh, in Denmark. And you can play with preferences in terms of emissions content, in terms of localization. And you can see what's the outcome of the, what the market outcome somehow depending on the agent preferences. All right. Five minutes to finish, that's going to be tight. I want to, uh, it's one last topic that's very important, uh, and that's going to be the fight, I think, for those who want to work on this kind of topic for the next five, ten years. So I hope uh, I convince you today and you come along to help me with this fight. You know the cost structure for electricity? We heard someone, you, you were mentioning Estoni the Estonian case, but I think we have all the same case. So, energy? 
Zero point thirteen, right? It's the delta base basically with this kind of zero like basically zero eight thirteen. Yo, after. What do you have on top? So I think it's like market this market price is maybe one one fourth or one third. Yeah. So then it's maybe like ten percent or something is basically renewable taxes. Yeah, so you have taxes. And then in the middle you have grid grid costs, network charges, transmission distribution. Right. So today it's flat. We all pay the same. It's per kilowatt hour, right? So it can be per kilowatt hour consumed, per kilowatt hour produced. There are different rules in different countries. Some start discussing we can differentiate, but typically wherever you are in the network, you don't know where your electricity comes from anyway. So you just have this flat network charge. Okay? I told you. I can try to be virtuous and buy my energy locally. Is this fair that I pay the same grid charges or network charges than another person who doesn't care and is importing from Norway some hydro, you know, and inducing a lot of need for network, right? Is this fair or not? Doesn't sound. Are yeah. Oh, charges or both. I put them both together in here. You could make a difference. You could split the two, but for the argument, you just see one network. And I will, I will tell you after, you can blend everything very, uh, very easily. Yeah? Sorry, I cannot hear you. You have both, transmission, distribution, charges. Yeah. Though today, you know, if you look at residential consumers, somehow they use not so much of the transmission level. You know, transmission level is really for exchanging between Germany and Norway uh, mostly. Whereas a small consumer, you don't get much out of. Uh, but you still have a tariff. For household, they, they just buy the, for me, I just pay the, the, the energy of the, the state through the energy. Uh, yeah, and it includes the grid cost. So in Denmark, one of the reforms, for instance, for this uh, electricity market 2.0, is to make it much more transparent. Uh, it's all integrated, but then you're much better informed in terms of, of this. Um, yeah, and uh, my point is that we would like to have this differentiated, okay? This has a lot uh, of potential consequences, but yeah, so today uh, in Denmark, Denmark is a world champion in terms of this uh, grid cost and uh, taxes, right? 85% of the electricity cost, it's online. Your electric is making these uh, surveys. 85% of the electricity cost is grid cost and taxes. So the argument, again, uh, related to work on demand response, whatever work you guys or we have been doing on demand response, price base, we're trying to tweak the energy cost, right? So we are trying to make them more fluctuating to get people to react to it. But somehow we are trying to play with something that's 15% of the full cost of electricity. So people don't really feel it. But if in a peer-to-peer -peer market, what we say, we're going to start differentiating this part of the cost, the 85%, then people are really going to feel it, right? They're going to really start making a difference. Okay, so we want to redesign it. In Denmark, we have a process of redesigning these uh, this, uh, network charges. Uh, why not? discussing also how this network charging could be changed in view of this consumer-centric electricity market. Okay, so this is something we're doing with Toma, who is not in the room. Um, and it has a lot of nice properties. If you redesign network charges, what you want to do, I have a key word here, you want people to understand how far they are from each other. So if I buy electricity from, I live in the north, in Helsinger, I buy electricity from Hansrive, which is this large offshore wind farm that's on the west coast of Denmark. Uh, the distance geographically is very far, but I mean, we have to think of electric distance. You know, how much of the network am I inducing in terms of need? Uh, there can be transformers on the way, there can be many things. But, so we want to summarize that in terms of electric distance to see how you, far you are electrically from one agent to the next. All right. Then when we've defined an electric distance, and we know how to do it uh, today, you have this uh, Tevna and PTDF-based uh, electric distance. There's a very nice paper by Andrew Keane, and I don't remember who else, uh, that discuss uh, electric distance. So you may, you may want to refer to that. Uh, then when we have the electric distance, we say, okay, we're going to define a network charge which is proportional to the electric distance, right? So if I buy electricity from very far away, I induce a lot of need for... Uh, grid and operation of the grid, and then the grid cost is going to be high. If I buy from my neighbor, grid cost is nearly zero, right? Okay? We want to do it in two different ways, or three different ways, fully socialized, so that's what we have today. 
So that's our benchmark. Uh, then we want to have a, a full uh, electric distance approach, so proportional to the distance, you pay your grid charges. And then we thought, now you're all accustomed to the transportation system in, uh, in Denmark, right? We have this zonal approach. So the way you pay for your transportation is how many zones you're going to cross, right? So we thought, hey, you know, why not doing it for electricity market, peer-to-peer -peer electricity market? So we, we have this um, 39 bus uh, system. Uh, we split it in four zones. So the design can be purely administrative huh, of these four zones. We don't have to make a bi-level optimization or something there yet. Uh, but let's say we have these zones, and they, if I'm here and I want to buy electricity from here, I mean, you necessarily have to cross uh, two zones, okay? So that's how we're going to make the cost. All right, so you can, uh, you can write criteria in different ways for the cost structure, so that is based on electric distance with Tevna, electric distance with PTDF-based, uh, this zonal view that I said, and the fully socialized that we have today. Then for each and every trait, you're going to share 50-50. So the supplier pay half of this cost related to the network charges, and the consumer pay half of this cost, which should be the case today normally uh, if the system was fair. So some countries apply that, some don't. I mean, uh, it's not really controversial. It's just a political choice. All right, but we've done it here 50-50 production consumption, and then we have this different system where it's also 50-50, but proportional to the grid. We can uh, write the... I'm going to finish in three minutes. Huh? We, we can write this optimization problem uh, as it was before with some extra terms for the, the grid cost, and it can be distributed the same way we distributed the other optimization problem. Uh, no problem. So let's see what's going on. So this is an example. Uh, try to visualize uh, this network. So that's the network, except that now we look at the graph of exchanges if you do peer-to-peer -peer on this network. So each and every agent has been trading with every other agent, right? All the cost functions are defined nicely in the paper and so on, so you can reproduce. OK, so this is the zone 1, the zone 2, the zone 3, the zone 4. It's a social, socialized cost for the grid. So no one cares. I just buy any I want. It's just about my cost function, me, 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 OK? Uh, and then all these uh, trades here are in red or green. The green ones, they are within the zone, and the red ones, they are from one zone to the next. So if you say the system operator had an objective, let's uh, assume that, as an objective to contain the trade uh, within areas because the, the transmission uh, between areas is quite small, uh, here it would not be very good because, I mean, most people don't care. They just want to buy all over the place. All right. If you have network charges that are proportional to an electric distance, you see there's not so many trades anymore. Uh, it's, it's a lot of pressure on the system. And so people really think twice before to buy on the other side. And again, related to investment, if you don't have the right uh, agent uh, within your zone, uh, typically you go down to your minimum and uh, you don't try to trade more than that. OK. And finally, uh, if you have this zonal principle, uh, somehow it's an in-between, so you give a lot of freedom to people to trade uh, within their zone, but you put pressure on them when they try to trade within zones, right? So it, it kind of meets the overall objective that you want to contain the trades. And if you, if you make some study in terms of uh, fairness, uh, this is an actually quite, uh, quite fair system uh, to do it like that. So we start from a system where I told you we go peer-to-peer, -peer and it could be an anarchy on the system because everybody trades with everybody, right? But you see, just with a simple tool that we have today already, network charges, if we redesign the network charges in a way that people understand how their activity in terms of trade reflects uh, costs induced uh, in terms of grid and grid management, then people could behave uh, quite more nicely. All right? So we go from anarchy to a well-behaving uh, market, you could say. All right, there's, there's other ways you may want to, to sparsify the game. So we call it sparsification because you try to remove a lot of edges in the game uh, for your graph. Some of the things, uh, we heard a few comments on the social aspects. Um, we are engineers, most of us, I think, here, right? Maybe some of us care about the social aspects. But in general, we are not that much involved into this interface between what we do and the people. But if you go towards this peer-to-peer -to -peer market or community-based market, it's a lot about the people. So we have to maybe be better at understanding what's in it for them and how we design tools uh, that fit their needs. Uh, what I've been discussing here, uh, there's a lot into it that is really disruptive and difficult to implement. Um, so I don't know if it's ever going to happen for real. 
So maybe it was a nice lecture, but you can just forget about it, you know, that's all right. Um, but I was telling you, in terms of business models, there are lots of cool things to do. So I'm waiting for Ersted to tell us about their business model. But uh, a year ago, I was saying, you know, why don't you sell directly from your nice offshore wind farms? You know, you can just brag. You're a world leader in offshore wind farms, and then I could directly buy from our offshore wind farm with some kind of crowdfunding top-up, so I feel I contribute to the deployment of offshore, right? There could be some very nice business models there. Okay, I told you about product differentiation. I told you about how we could redesign the game uh, to make the market more well-behaved. Uh, there's a lot of room for funky stuff if you want to contribute to these fields. Um, obviously, it's much more complicated than that. Uh, we've not considered forecast uncertainty. If you have everybody being prosumers with uh, solar PV and uh, volatile demand, I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty in the system. How are you going to deal with that? Um, the system operator has not said if he or she was happy with that yet. So how we make sure that uh, we reconcile the interest of the consumers by going consumer-centric and the system operator. Uh, and then uh, we don't want to erase everything, you know. So we have to think of mixed market design. So that's a general question you may think of when you want to introduce something new. So it can be a market design, that can be a product. You want to understand if this product or design can coexist with what's out there, right? So is this peer-to-peer -peer market design exclusive? So it cannot live together with the normal market as we have today? Or can we make them coexist? That's one of the, of, of the big questions. All right, so if you want to contribute to the field, just read that first, right? Uh, you can contact me or Fabio or Etienne or whoever you want. And I would be very happy uh, to hear that some of you actually got convinced by this idea and contribute in this space. Thank you. <laughs> I got a bit over time, but uh, Spiros uh, stole 15 minutes of my time, right? Yes, Eduardo? Well, we have time for two questions, maybe. Just we need coffee and... It could be that I totally missed it, uh, totally missed it and you actually said it, but uh, what time scale are we talking about? when you talk about this, this trades, Is it real time? Is it, uh, you know, a period ahead? Is it day so ahead? So it's on purpose, I didn't. So you, you were right, I didn't say it. Well, I talked about the, the wholesale electricity market. The wholesale electricity market is day ahead, right? Buying peer-to-peer -peer day ahead from the PV panel of your neighbor might be a bit funny, okay? Uh, if you think of the market design, uh, there's a few groups in the world that are thinking of it. What are the most relevant design if you think of time scales, right? If, if you think of a full peer-to-peer uh, -peer real time, it can be very nice, but then we're going to have a lot of worries in terms of price volatility, impact on investment and everything. Uh, what you can do is having, again, mixed market design. So you can have some kind of options. So it's like a forward market. You know, you try to book some energy or, or to put some option on energy at longer time scale, and then you have the real time market, which is just on the fly, right? So th there's many possibilities in terms of uh, mixed market design. And on purpose, I didn't want to discuss timescales because it makes things much more complicated to have to think of all that together. But this is possible, I mean, yeah. But it, also really it really sort of influences the way, what, basically whether you can influence behavior or not. Because I can imagine if I get a day of you know, lead time to, to change my, I don't know, my breakfast time tomorrow, that's a, one thing. But if I want to have a coffee now and my coffee machine is telling me this to, now it's costing you too much. Mm, it, but that's, that's the problem of exactly. this, you know, the input, flexibility and the utility function might be highly dependent on behavior and time scales and perception, you know, uh, availability of information. That's true, yeah. That, there was a question there, but uh, yeah. You, you had a question also? There was a question behind you? Yeah. Go, 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 go. Uh, so my, my question was in relation to the last thing which you showed about the, the zones. Yeah. And in relation to the zones, you said that the price structure which is there comprises of the, I mean, if I consider in terms of LMP, it would be the marginal cost plus the cost of the network plus losses. So in your network, do you consider losses as well? I mean, no, Not in this work here. We've simplified as much as possible. Okay. The, the full version of the work that we have now that's going to be submitted has losses also. Uh, because losses, it's a good point. If you make people feel the cost of losses as a function of electric distance, it's also going to specify automatically because you don't want to buy from far away because you're going to have to pay for losses, right? So that's where I was saying there's actually things that very naturally will make that the game will become sparse with the cost of losses, with the grid-induced cost, and so on. So, yeah. uh, and sorry, one more 
one follow up question is that uh, you've written it as zone but I do not get a feel of the magnitude of the zone like is it a scale of kilometers or a scale of uh, 100 kilometers what are we talking about I mean here okay this is a test system but it's for New England so it's quite big right but it's, it's a stylized system from IEEE, you know, so... Well, I was saying we want to look a lot at scalability. So in terms of scalability, the test system we want to work with are the scale of a city and then at scale of a country or a region, right? So that would be the, the aim. But, I mean, already for some of this work, for small test cases, you need a supercomputer. Like, it's, it's crazy. Even on the supercomputer, at 300 agents negotiating, we're already uh, are struggling. So imagine if you want to do it for six million uh, households. Or, yeah. what are the for these test cases? Yeah, for so the it, but you, you can read the paper. Here we do mm -hmm. it as a 15 minutes ahead of trade. So it's a real time market, really. Yeah. Yeah. Last, last, last question. Yeah. Now, you, you did, he didn't ask anything. So it's only fair, right? We talked about fairness. Yeah. And I, just for that, it was a good idea to change yeah. the sign. Thank you. That's the last so question. I'm sorry. We can discuss it over lunch. So you're okay. assuming that each zone is, has enough capacity to meet its own demand, right? Like but it's, it's like in a normal market. Uh, you assume that there's enough uh, supply for the consumer. So what if, if I want to buy, I wanna buy locally, energy. but there's no one producing locally? Yeah, but so so I, we I call it preferences, right? Yeah. So you would prefer, and you're ready to pay to have something local, but if it's not there, you know, yeah. you so would get all, somewhere. All so it's the same with nuclear. I would prefer not to buy nuclear energy, but if it's what's left, I'm going to have to get it. I'm right? going to have to buy it like elsewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. But what if all my neighbors are like, we are all competing for the same energy. So yeah. isn't that going to make the, like a big price spike or, or like a... But that, that's what some of the questions we had. We would like to look more into the game theoretical aspects, but more on the social side, like behavioral economics. Mm -hmm. There's going to be bonded rationality. There's going to be spiteful behavior locally. You know, you hate your neighbor. You want to make sure you screw him consistently on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's the impact on investment. Because as you have this nice incentives through operation and market, maybe it creates the incentive for investment locally, maybe not, right? So I was saying Pula was working on that uh, with batteries, for instance. So yeah. there's so many topics, right? Yeah. So we can have an intuition, we can have an opinion, but I think there's so much research to be done that, yeah, we cannot know. We have to stop yep. coffee, and I have an appointment in five minutes, so thank you. Thank you.